I'm Lauren bourignac Hozal, the Associate Dean of the Honors College, and it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 20th anniversary celebration of the Stuart and Nancy Rabinowitz Honors College. Let's pause for a moment to acknowledge the land on which we find ourselves, the traditional territory of indigenous people, including the Massapequas, the Matincock, and the Merricks. For more than 10 years of those now 20 years of the Honors College at Hofstra, Every Tuesday and Thursday morning, I have found myself here in Monroe Auditorium, as I am today, for culture and expression. And during that decade, through sleight of hand and much hard work, I have seen Honors College transform before my eyes in astonishing and wonderful ways, from HUHC to RHC. In that decade, we have also seen our world face unimaginable challenges from pandemic to war, and of course, with increasing urgency, the great existential threat, our issue for today, the climate crisis. It is here during these mornings and also in the Honors College offices in Axon Library with the amazing Peggy Ann Matusiak at the helm for all 20 years. It is during our open mic nights on the 13th floor of Vanderpool Hall, the Honors College dorm, on our many trips to the city and around Long Island with our wonderful faculty mentors, um, and our service projects with the Service Corps and biweekly tutoring at Hempstead High, that we come together students and faculty to make sense of these difficult issues, to find an obligatory note of realism, of creative action, of humor, and of hope. And it is here that we have built and rebuilt our own Honors College community as a first step, I hope, towards rebuilding our planet. Before Dean Frasina comes up on stage, another wonderful surprise, a few words from the ninth and current president of Hofstra University, Dr. Susan Poser. Dr. Poser came to us after serving as the provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs at the University of Illinois in Chicago. In her inaugural address this past fall, Dr. Poser referenced the Indian novelist Arahundati Roy, who spoke of pandemic as a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. That image has stayed with me ever since, as I seem to find myself in many gateways, both literal and figurative. So forgive me for recycling, Aren't we all supposed to be recycling? But I will requote those inspiring words as they bear repeating and feel strangely appropriate today. And this is Arahundu Roy. We can choose to walk through that portal, dragging carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Please welcome Dr. Poser. Thank you so much for that kind um, introduction. And uh, good morning. I'm really delighted to be here. 
uh, for the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Honors College. Congratulations to Dean Fresina and to all the faculty and administrators who've given their time and talent to creating and growing this gem on our campus. I'm also pleased to welcome Dr. Robert Pollan to Hofstra, and I look forward to his lecture. My first impressions of the Hofstra's, of Hofstra's Honors College uh, were, of course, as an outsider. I did not know very much about the college before I arrived last August, aside from its great reputation and that it attracts outstanding students. Many honors colleges around the country can, of course, claim the same thing. What I have found as I have learned more over the past year is that Hofstra's Honors College doesn't just offer excellent classes taught by our very best faculty, and it doesn't just offer a living and learning community in its residence halls, but it lives and it breathes excellence and community. From the emphasis on the website about conversation and dialogue, and of course, snacks in the dean's office, um, to the many opportunities it provides students outside of the classroom to grow and to learn, whether that's doing research with a faculty member uh, or taking in a Broadway show, or as I just saw on one of these slides, going to a Mets game, which is pretty much the best thing you can do for community um, together with other honor students. This wraparound mentoring doesn't just happen. It's nurtured by the administration and faculty who understand the value to our students of high level classes and of high expectations, but who also understand the value of the ethic of care that helps and encourages these students to reach their potential, both academically and personally. So there is so much to celebrate today and we should get started. So again, congratulations, Dean Fresina and Senior Associate Dean Robinson, and thank you for all you and all, everybody has done in, for the Honors College, all the administrators, staff, and faculty um, who have dedicated themselves to this treasure that is the Hofstra Honors College. Thank you. You all know the Dean of the Honors College and also a professor of philosophy and religion, Dr. Warren Frasina. It is his gentle and strong guiding hand that has allowed us to navigate our way thoughtfully through the many challenges of the past 20 years and to evolve and thrive as the Stuart and Nancy Rabinowitz Honors College. I hid my speech under the, under the keyboard. So I knew it would be here when I got up here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for that kind introduction. And thank you, President Poser, for your welcoming remarks. At nearly the end of your first year as president, it is hard to overestimate the excitement among the faculty and my fellow administrators regarding this next phase of Hofstra's history. Building institutions requires leaders who, are, who see clearly where we are, but who are also capable of imagining and communicating what we can become. In summing up those inaugural remarks that Lauren just referenced, you said, we have the ability to be nimble and to take the strategic risks that we must take, and we have the alumni community and friends to guide and support us. If we have the commitment, the discipline, and the energy, we will prosper as never before. By now, I'm certain you know that all of us are with you in the pursuit of that. I also want to thank the students, faculty, and administrative colleagues who are with us today in person, but also those who are watching via the live stream. 
it's truly a joy to be celebrating this milestone with all of you. Now, I know it's a cliche, but it really does seem like only yesterday, not long after I arrived at Hofstra as a newly appointed assistant professor, that my department chair, Kathleen Wallace, began asking me questions about honors colleges. Before coming to Hofstra, I spent four years as a faculty member in the University of Houston's Honors College, where I watched its founders, Ted Estes and Bill Monroe, build a program whose impact radiated through the institution, elevating the U of H's reputation both within Texas and beyond. At that time, Kathleen was a member of a task force of faculty and administrators discussing the possibility of expanding expanding Hofstra's commitment to honors work beyond its long-standing, effective, and deliberately small honors program. And she thought I might have something to contribute to the conversation. Any discussion of honors at Hofstra should begin by acknowledging that the honors, that the honors college we are celebrating today was preceded by an honors program led by, led by Helene Wasek, a classic scholar, and longtime member of the faculty. I've met many alumni from that program. They speak eloquently about the ways it fostered close relationships with a small cadre of dedicated faculty whose commitment and expertise quite literally changed their lives forever. Given the honors program's success in those ways, some might wonder why Hofstra felt the need to create an honors college. We have then Provost Herman Berliner to thank because back in the late 1990s, he understood Hofstra's ambitions. And he knew that to fulfill them, we had to attract and retain those high school students who had the strongest preparation for college. That meant moving from an honors program that might enroll a dozen or so students a year to an honors college capable of attracting hundreds. For that end, we needed to communicate to such students how an honors college could nurture their intellectual, social, and career ambitions in ways that were comparable to what any other institution in the country could offer. As I look out over the audience this morning, I am so pleased to see many of those task force members who I first met when I was invited to join those deliberations. I learned so much from them as we pursued questions like, what is our core mission with this honors college? How are we going to shape students' experiences to realize that mission? And how will all of this fit within and or relate to the existing institutional structure? With the hindsight of our first 20 years, it is easy to see that our core mission has always been to enrich the experiences of Hofstra students both within the Honors College but throughout the university as well. Toward that end, we created a front-loaded curriculum that drew together Honors College students via a four-course common first-year experience that we call Culture and Expression. After the first years, we turned those same students loose to pursue honors work with individual faculty in regular courses throughout the university. In this way, our curriculum wraps around all degree plans. It allows students to tailor their honors work to their passions. All of this while accelerating the mentoring process by fostering deep and meaningful relationships between students and faculty across the campus. Numbers matter when you are trying to change an institution's culture. So it's important to report that for the last 15 years or so, the Rabinowitz Honors College, or RHC for short, um, has been enrolling approximately 250 first year students every fall. In addition, each semester, we enroll another 50 or more current students who earn a GPA of 3.6 or higher. As a result, the RHC population regularly tops 1,300 students. 
Thus, every department in almost every course at Hofstra boasts its own cadre of RHC students whose presence lifts the level of discourse across the university. This is what we hoped for when we set ourselves the goal of enriching the experiences of, of students both inside RHC, but also across the university as well. Now, at a moment like this, it is natural for an administrator like me to cite numbers, as I have just been doing. And it would be easy to go on this way, pointing to, say, our 3,000 plus alumni, some of whom are just now hitting their stride in outstanding careers across the United States and internationally as well. Instead, I'd like to step back from the numbers to speak more personally about a moment in Honors College's first year when I came to know more precisely what we really meant when we said it was our mission to enrich students' experiences while at Hofstra. The Honors College launched in the fall of 2001. Working with my acting co-dean, Stephen Russell, who went on to be RHC's founding dean, we welcomed 93 students who had taken a chance and enrolled in this newly formed Honors College. We were so very excited. After all those months of planning, we were bringing into being something that had only existed in our imagination. You know, of course, what happened. Only one day into the new academic year, we woke to find the world we thought we knew no longer available to us or to our students. With ambulances and fire engines racing westward on Hempstead Turnpike, the university wrestled with how best to care for our students, many of whom had friends and family at or near ground zero. What to do? What to say? Truly. There were no words. The university decided not to cancel classes, as that might leave students isolated and afraid in their residence hall. And I admit, at first, I thought we really should call off class, thinking that none of us is capable of concentrating. And perhaps, more to the point, that I might not be up to the task of facing students at this terrible moment. But then I remembered I wouldn't have to approach class on September 12th alone. In one of the most powerful coincidences of my teaching career, I was already scheduled to lecture that day on the book of Job, the story of a man who struggles in the face of unfathomable grief. I entered the lecture hall in something of a daze. I had spent the night rereading Job with new eyes and reframing my remarks to draw directly upon what this ancient work had to say to us in that terrible. In slow, measured phrases, I tried to help us all see that there was nothing patient about Job's response to his suffering. He rails against God and, it, and a universe that would treat him so miserably. Job was for me, and I expect for many of our students, the perfect channel for the immeasurable grief we were all experiencing. He offered no platitudes, he gave no easy answers, and called out his and our suffering for what it was. When that lecture was over, a student got up, came down the aisle, and gave me the one and only hug I have ever received after giving a lecture. <laughs> That, stu that student knew instinctively what Job had led us to. What we were experiencing was truly beyond what could be communicated directly with words of comfort. Silent awe at the enormity of things beyond our ken was indeed the appropriate first response to what had happened. And finally, that the only way through the darkness would be as members of a community. I bring this moment to mind today because it really did shift my understanding of my role as teacher and as a leader within a university. Yes, it is our job to cultivate in our students the skills they need to get on in the world. Yes, we are responsible for making certain that upon graduation, 
they are prepared to take up their role as members of a larger social order. But first and foremost, we are caretakers of one another. It will always be the job of those of us who teach or play leadership roles at Hofstra to think first about how we bring about that sense of community, which is the foundation for everything else we hope to achieve. For this reason, the Honors College at Hofstra has always been more than just an academic community. We approach our students' lives holistically, keeping in mind the extent to which we need to help them construct and reconstruct the lines of connection, linking what we study with how we and they hope to live. With this in mind, we opted to embed today's celebration of our 20th anniversary within the spring 2022 Culture and Expression first year classes. All semester, my colleagues and our students have been asking ourselves a question. Is capitalism sustainable? Specifically, we've been wondering whether and if so, to what extent our current economic system might be responsible for or contributing to three looming crises. The problems associated with climate change, the way an ever widening wealth income gap is undermining commitment to democratic norms, both within the United States, but across the globe, and the inability to resolve seemingly intractable social justice problems. Today's keynote speaker, who will be introduced in a moment, was selected in part to illustrate how CNE and the larger RHC curriculum makes visible those linkages between what we study and how we hope to live. Now, like any good administrator, I could go on detailing all the ways in which our program enriches the lives of honor students. But self-congratulation has a very limited shelf life, especially when you're standing at a podium. And besides, I'm really eager to hear our speaker. So let me turn away from that part of my remarks by pointing out that none of what we've achieved in the past 20 years would be possible without extraordinary support from across Hofstra and within RHC itself. I've already noted the role Herman Berliner played in imagining and helping to establish the Honors College as a possibility. But I would be remiss not to note all of the support he and the entire provost office's team provided throughout RHC's history. Just as importantly, I must also recognize that RHC came into being at the beginning of President Stuart Rabinowitz's presidency. His time at the helm was, despite several severe economic shocks, a period of growth and innovation, and upon his retirement, the Hofstra Board of Trustees honored that legacy by naming us Stuart and Nancy Rabinowitz Honors College. None of what we achieved during his presidency could have happened without his continuing support. And we're proud to be recognized as a part of his legacy. Of course, I am also grateful to my fellow deans, especially current interim provost, but soon to be dean again, Janet Lenahan, for the crucial role she's played in helping us navigate this transition to Hofstra's new and exciting next phase. And I want to especially thank the department chairs and their faculty who have throughout the years made it possible to bring the very best we have to RHC students. I've learned so much from my colleagues, especially as a participating member in the teaching team of c &E. Working with you has been nothing short of an inspiration. Now, in my time as RHC's Dean, I've been blessed with Rabinowitz Honors College staff colleagues who know instinctively that our first priority will always be helping our students figure out what they need and then doing what we can to make it happen. Throughout this tenure, RHC senior associate deans, Neil Donahue, Vimala Pashupathy, and now Kamika Robinson, have counseled me wisely, helped me avoid many, many mistakes, and led us to take on new ventures that I never would have thought out on my own. Lauren bergner kozel our current associate dean and leader of our faculty mentor and co-curricular program, is singularly responsible 
for all the ways our community reaches beyond its borders, both culturally, but also through service to our neighbor. For almost 15 years, Rita Corbett was our senior support specialist who ferreted out countless ways small administrative adjustments on our part would make our students' lives easier. She was followed this year in that position by Eftihia Christophoratus, who is already a favorite of our students. And last, but certainly not least, I must acknowledge Peggy Ann Matusiak, our office manager and director of alumni relations. She was with us when we began, the, began in the fall of 2001 and has been the one consistent member of the RHC staff who has been there for our students throughout its 20 year history. She's done more to frame the RHC student experience than anyone else. We could not have gotten to this point without her warmth, her humor, and her care attention. Before closing, I have one more important expression of gratitude that I must share. Almost 10 years ago, we lost a brilliant, talented student named Peter A. Keller. He is remembered in so many ways here at Hofstra, not least for the impact he had on the a cappella community, whose annual concert in Pete's memory is a permanent fixture of Hofstra's cultural scene. But within RHC, a fund dedicated to his memory has been enriching the lives of RHC students by enabling us to bring in guest speakers and performance groups, almost always with the aim of enhancing the CE experience. Pete's parents, Chris and Suzanne Telleha, who are dear friends of RHC and myself, are with us today as they are for almost every major RHC event. I want you all to know that today's 20th anniversary celebration has been underwritten by the Peter A. Pelleha Memorial Fund. Thank you, Chris, Suzanne, and all of those who knew Pete and who get, have given to the fund over the years. And finally, thank all of you for your time and attention for helping us celebrate the Rabinowitz Honors College's first 20 years. Looking ahead to the next 20 and following on President Poser's challenge, I am confident we have the commitment, the discipline, and the energy to prosper as never before. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am Dr. Shamika Robinson, the Senior Associate Dean of the Rabinowitz Honors College, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Dr. Robert Poland is a distinguished university professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is also the founder and president of PAIR, Pollen Energy and Retrofits, an Amherst, Massachusetts-based green energy company operating throughout the United States. His books, and there are many of them, include The Living Wage, Building a Fair Economy, co-authored in 1998, Contours of Dissent, U.S. Economic Fractures and the Landscape of Global Austerity, published in 2003, an Employment Targeted Economic Program for South Africa, co-authored in 2007. A Measure of Fairness, the Economics of Living Wages and Minimum Wages in the United States, co-authored in 2008. Back to Full Employment, published in 2012. Greening the Global Economy, published in 2015. Economic Analysis of Medicare for All, co-authored in 2018, and Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet, co-authored in 2020. He has worked as a consultant for the U.S. Department of Energy and the International Labor Organization, 
the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and numerous non-governmental organizations in several countries and in U.S. states and municipalities on various aspects of building high employment green economies. He has also directed projects of employment creation and poverty reduction in Sub-Saharan Africa for the United Nations Developmental Program. He has also worked with many U.S. non-governmental organizations on creating living wage statues at both the statewide and municipal levels, on financial regulatory policies, and on the economies of single-payer health care in the United States. Between 2011 through 2016, he was a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the European Commission Project on Financialization, Economy, Society, and Sustainable Development. He was selected by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the 100 leading global thinkers for 2013. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Pollack. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here on such an important occasion. Uh, it's incredible what you all have achieved over 20 years with the Honors College. I've been hearing a little bit about it. I know some of the faculty. I've known Robbie Gutman for a long time, and I've met some of the others. Uh, and uh, it's, it's great to be part of event and celebration. So, uh, and I'm also really impressed with the course that you all have been taking. And I guess this lecture is part of the course. You're here uh, to be, because you're supposed to be here. <laughs> so um, let me just start out with, I, um, Warren sent me the syllabus for the course. Thank you. And so uh, just to take off from the, uh, the preamble of the syllabus itself is this question, a uh, rather large question, looming question, critical question, is, uh, is capitalism sustainable? And as it says in the, um, on the syllabus, one of the most, and Warren, uh, I'll repeat it because it's a very important uh, way to think and to um, introduce my, my topic. One of the most important questions of the 21st century is whether capitalism, economic system which has shaped so much of the global economy for better and worse, can be sustained in the face of several ongoing crises. Climate crisis, the income and wealth inequality crisis, the social justice crisis, and perhaps most dangerous of all, crisis of our ongoing failure to sufficiently respond. So my uh, presentation is an effort to not to respond to all of these all at once, but to try to integrate a response around the specific, and I would argue, uh, most urgent question, the truly existential crisis that we face now with climate change. And uh, the way that I want to address it is to think about ways to uh, move on to a sustainable path, a sustainable economic path, a sustainable path uh, for uh, e ecological path, and in terms of uh, reducing issues, as Warren mentioned, uh, global inequality, um, wealth inequality, income inequality, as part of an overall uh, framework. And that's what I would call the Global Green New Deal. So um, for old people like me, uh, we know what the phrase New Deal refers to, um, but I won't assume that everybody knows. Uh, so forgive me. Uh, the, the New Deal was the economic program developed in the 1930s under President Frank Delano Roosevelt um, as a response to the Great Depression. Uh, it was a unique program. Now, now that it happened, it all seems like, oh, that's obvious. Of course you want to do this. Um, at the time, that was, was not obvious uh, how to address 
the economic, the severe economic crisis, Great Depression, which led effectively the rise of fascism, the World War II, the Nazism. So um, the, the New Deal was a program to uh, address the economic crisis, to overcome the economic crisis, to overcome the collapse of the financial system, mass unemployment, and to do it in a way that also uh, advanced egalitarianism within capitalism. So it was not a program to overturn capitalism uh, in all of its features, but it was a program to transform capitalism, to advance a more egalitarian framework for capitalism and a more ecological sustainable framework. It was one of the major features of the uh, 1930s New Deal was precisely to uh, create jobs uh, for people to work on ecological uh, sustainable projects. Not on a big scale, but the idea was. So what I'm talking about now is a global Green New Deal <coughs> that <coughs> we can achieve effectively these same aims as the 1930s New Deal, that is to create uh, more democratic and egalitarian societies that are also ecologically sustainable. Do it right in the face of our climate crisis, our existential ecological crisis. So uh, how do we get there? Not exactly an easy question, uh, but uh, in my opinion, uh, the basics are pretty straightforward. They're not that complicated. Uh, and so that's really what I wanna go through a bit. Uh, and I'll, I'll present some of my own research, some more general, I, I, by the way, I'm not a climate scientist. So I have to refer to work of climate scientists in terms of understanding the uh, magnitude of the climate crisis. And then we can go on and talk about some of the ways to think about addressing it. So, uh, climate crisis, uh, can we address it within the framework of capitalism? So back to the question, is capitalism sustainable? Can we address the climate crisis within the framework of capitalism? We better. You know why? Because we have no choice. Uh, whatever one might think about capitalism, it's not going to be gone as an economic system in the next seven years. Uh, it's not going to be gone in the next 25 years. And effectively, we need to solve the climate crisis within that time frame. Within, uh, I mean, we have to basically stabilize the climate, and I'll go through details on that, over the next uh, 20 to 25 years with major advances forward, which I'll go through in a minute, uh, by 2030. And remember, we're halfway through 2022. So 2030 is only seven and a half years. Okay, so that's the aim of the Global Green New Deal, as I define it. Other people may have other definitions. Um, that's fine, uh, but in terms of my definition, uh, yes, we must solve it within the framework of capitalism. At the same time, the project of advancing a climate stabilization program within capitalism will itself transform capitalism. And it won't necessarily transform it for the better, but I think there is a very high likelihood that it will, that at least that it can. And that's what we need to fight for. Uh, in the sense uh, that first and foremost thing uh, that we have to do in order to address the climate crisis, very, very simple, we have to stop burning oil, coal, and natural gas energy, period. Uh, and so that therefore the fossil fuel industry effectively is going to have to be eliminated, euthanized. Uh, it, it won't be, uh, it can't. Okay, now that in itself is gigantically transformative because the fossil fuel industry, is very big and powerful uh, in the United States and throughout the world, ask Vladimir Putin. Um, and then, uh, if we're going to eliminate fossil fuels as an energy source, and, and it 
uh, fossil fuels constitutes about 80 to 85% of all energy supply globally. So if we're gonna bring it down to zero, obviously we have to create some alternative and that is a clean energy infrastructure, energy infrastructure uh, whose foundations are renewable energy and high efficiency. And in building that alternative energy infrastructure, we will generate a wide opportunity, in my view, for workers, uh, for jobs, for communities, for new ownership forms, uh, private ownership, as well as public ownership. So that's basically it. Okay. Now, in terms of framing it, how severe is the climate crisis? Well, if you've heard of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, IPC is an agency of the United Nations. They themselves don't, con uh, they don't conduct research on their own. They synthesize the research of leading climate science scientists from all over the world, thousands of them. Uh, there are two or three at my own university, very outstanding uh, climate uh, scientists working with the IPCC. The IPCC has been putting out regular uh, studies that synthesize the most recent work. And uh, actually, there was one that came out even more recently than this one, the February uh, 28th. But anyway, uh, this is the February 28th, and this is the summary, okay? Uh, Human-induced climate change is causing dangerous and widespread disruption in nature and affecting the lives of billions of people around the world. There's 8 billion, so we already have billions getting affected. Despite efforts to reduce the risk, people and ecosystems least able to cope. So talking about inequality, people and ecosystems least able to cope are being hardest hit. So uh, exacerbating inequality is one of the features of climate change as it unfolds at present. Okay, this is the chair of the IPCC, uh, his summary statement from the February report. This report is a dire warning about the consequences of inaction. Now, you know, we get used to hyperbolic terms. Uh, that's too bad because uh, dire means dire, okay? And uh, we can't dismiss it when somebody at this level of authority at, at, a re at the leading source of research on climate change tells us that we are facing a dire warning. It shows, the study shows that climate change is a grave and mounting threat to our well being and a healthy planet. Our actions today uh, will shape how people adapt and nature responds to increasing climate risk. And again, I want to emphasize we hear these things, we must act, we must act, we must act now. Today actually means today, it does mean today. It really also means yesterday, the day before, the month, five years before, 10 years before. Uh, the level of uh, response has been adequate, inadequate for decades, and we're running, truly running out of time, as I'm going to Okay. <coughs> uh, the uh, report from February and its predecessors, in particular, uh, the 2018 report by the IPC, is really critical in that it raised the level of severity, its understanding of the level of severity to an extent that had not been done before. Now, keep in mind, the IPCC, again, really collects research from thousands of people. Um, and these are uh, serious professional researchers, and the IPCC itself tries to present things as cautiously as possible. They're often criticized for understating the degree of risk that we face with climate change. So that's the context in which we have to uh, absorb what the IPCC is telling us. There are leading climate scientists who regularly criticize the IPCC uh, for being uh, uh, too sanguine about the severity of the problem. Okay, anyway, so in the 2018 study, what was the major change relative to previous studies? 
was that they concluded that we needed to stabilize the global mean temperature at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. So we're talking about what was the average global temperature in 1850, 1820. And their conclusion was in order to maintain uh, ecological sustainability, we cannot go above 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to where we were in 1850. That's their conclusion. Now, why that was a really big deal at the time in 2018 was that the IPCC itself for decades had said, we can stabilize at two degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial level. Now you can say, what's the big deal? Uh, one and a half degrees, two degrees, half a degree. It is Celsius, by the way, which is bigger units Fahrenheit. But anyway, that was a big deal. Uh, that is a 25% increase, uh, or, or at least a, a uh, compacting of the climate stabilization goal. And it suggests that the research from uh, climate scientists is telling us that getting to the one and uh, two degrees of warming goal is going to set off irre irreversible effects that are uh, going to be continued indefinitely. And that therefore we can no longer be satisfied with a two degrees Celsius stabilization. Uh, and as they say, uh, the IPCC is telling us uh, failure to hit the one and a half degrees stabilization target relative to pre-industrial levels is going to intensify the things that we're already seeing. Right? Heat extremes, heavy precipitation, droughts, sea level rise, and so forth. I was just reading this morning, I'm sure a lot of you have read about the heat extreme in India. Uh, the average temperature over, I think it was the last month, I, I'm just reading from uh, this morning, the average temperature uh, over the last month in Delhi was 104 degrees Fahrenheit, average. And that's where we are headed. Uh, so the uh, IPCC's 2018 report did also lay out uh, a, a stabilization target. So we need to get to a one and a half degrees Celsius stabilization. And how do we get there? They said, basically, they set out two critical goals. One is that we have to cut emissions of carbon dioxide by 50%, roughly, as of 2030, and seven and a half years from now. I mentioned burning fossil fuels. The major source of uh, carbon uh, dioxide CO2 emissions is burning fossil fuels. That's the connection. So we have to cut by 2050, and we have to be at zero by, uh, I'm sorry, we have to cut 50% uh, by 2030, and we have to be at zero by 2050. Um, that's it. That's it. Those are the goals. Now, uh, these goals have been embraced um, to some more or less degree uh, by various groups, uh, uh, more so in, in Europe, in Western Europe. Uh, in the US, uh, maybe some of you have heard of uh, the Green New Deal Network. Uh, the Green New Deal Network is a coalition, many groups around the country, and they advanced something called the Thrive Agenda, Thrive Agenda, uh, that uh, was a program, is a program to hit these targets uh, through investments in uh, energy efficiency renewable energy, and to do it in a way that supports job creation. That's why they're called the Green New Deal Network. Um, and uh, it was an it was um, ambitious program. It was endorsed by your Senator Schumer, uh, among others. Uh, but, you know, putting it through the political grind, uh, it certainly did not survive uh, in total, when uh, President Biden introduced uh, the so-called Build Back Better program. 
The Build Back Better program, if I wanted to characterize it, is roughly uh, one third of the level of investment and support, uh, one third uh, of what the Green New Deal Network had to do, drive agenda. Again, endorsed by leading mainstream politician, Mr. Schumer. Uh, where are we with the Build Back Better program? Again, uh, as of this morning, uh, who knows? Uh, it, it hasn't passed. Uh, it, you know, President Biden thought it was going to pass months ago, at least in some form similar to how he introduced it. But because of the opposition of two Democratic senators, Senator Anshin of West Virginia and Senator Sinema of Arizona, Nothing has passed. We just don't know if any will pass. In the discussion period, if you want, I, I myself wrote a Green New Deal program for the state of West Virginia uh, and introduced it to the uh, senator and uh, Manchin and his staff. They were very enthusiastic over Zoom. Uh, yeah, so I, I apparently didn't persuade the senator at least not sufficient. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the uh, disparity of the crisis, and then we'll talk about the program, Green New Deal. So um, here's where we are with the global mean temperature. As I said, you know, according to the IPCC, we need to be at no more than one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. And this shows the trajectory of the global mean temperature. As you can see, um, for, uh, this is zero. It's called a temperature anomaly. Uh, basically, there was no uh, global warming uh, that was observable uh, until about World War II, although we've known about the problem of global warming prior to that. There wasn't really any manifestation of it to speak of. Uh, we had this increase in the global mean temperature. You can see that 0 0.2 degrees Celsius above the uh, pre-industrial level. And it drops back down. But really, as a phenomenon that we need to focus on, the uh, rise of the global mean temperature starts around 19. Whether it was about the same time that Ronald Reagan became president, uh, we can discuss that. Uh, but okay, uh, the global mean temperature starts rising in uh, 1980 at 0 0.2. Uh, now, even this chart, which I just got off the internet, uh, is not really even showing us the most recent numbers because by this chart we're at 1.0. But according to that February. IPCC report, they're saying we're at 1.2. Either way, you can see the trajectory. There's no question where we're going. This is by 2020, we're at 1.0 or maybe 1.2 by 2021. In any case, we will breach 1.5, uh, certainly within 20 years, if the world proceeds anywhere uh, similar to how we are operating at present. And this is what I want to show you next. So uh, what are we looking at? Um, this shows you the level of CO2 emissions in the world now and projections through uh, 2030 and 2050. And the projections are by the organization in Paris called the International Energy Agency that is the leading mainstream research and policy entity working on all energy issues. They were created effectively by the oil industry in the 1970s. So they are hardly, you know, left-wing NGO uh, working to fight climate change. They are a thoroughly mainstream uh, institution. And this is their model. Okay, so here's what their model says. Remember, the IPCC says we have to cut emissions by 50% as of 2030 and be at zero by 2050, okay? Here's where we are now. 
least as of 2019, this is 36 billion tons, global CO2 emissions, 36 billion tons, okay? Now, here is, this is the International Energy Agency's projection of what is gonna happen in the world if all the governments in the world uh, do what they've committed to do, which they may not do, unless we force them, but if they do everything that they are doing now, here's what happens to global emissions. 2030, no change, zero change, no reduction. Uh, by 2050, emissions are at almost 34 billion tons. So follow what the, where we're going in the world now. If you believe climate science, we are absolutely, as I say here, courting ecological disaster. That is not hyperbole. That's just looking at this, okay? Now, even more frightening from my view is now the International Energy Agency asks this question. What if all the governments in the world not only do what they're doing now with respect to climate stabilization, but they, they do everything that they promised to do at the major uh, climate conference in 2015 in Paris, and they do everything they promised to do just prior to the Glasgow Climate Conference this last November, November 2021. Now, this is their projection. This is the International Energy Agency's projection. Okay, here's where we are again, 36 billion tons. 2030, minimal reduction, 10% uh, reduction. By 2050, we're still at 21 billion tons. So our co they could be wrong. Economists are wrong a lot, especially projecting. But uh, this, they, they certainly have no bias in favor of uh, presenting a dire picture. Quite the opposite. Uh, nevertheless, this is what they're finding. We keep burning oil, coal, and natural gas to produce energy. We don't even come close, not even close, to hitting the emission reduction target. And that's why I say we are facing ecological disaster. Again, without hyperbole. True. Just true. Okay. Now, now the more positive story. Sorry, I, I already heard that you've already been totally brought down the whole semester. Uh, <laughs> and yes, I just dug a hole a little bit deeper, and now we're going to emerge out. Okay, so let's talk about the Global Green New Deal. Uh, according to research that I've been doing with my coworkers and other people done similar research, I think there is a very straightforward path to climate stabilization just a matter of getting on that path. Technically, economically, financially, we can get there. Okay, and what does it mean? Yes, A, we have to stop burning fossil fuels to produce energy. That is the single biggest driver of climate change. Not the only one, the single biggest. Uh, secondly, well, we're gonna phase out the fossil fuel industry. Uh, that means there's a lot of working people, a lot of communities that are dependent for their livelihood on the fossil fuel industry. So integral to any global Green New Deal has to be programmed to move these people into other uh, opportunities, to other ways to earn livings and to sustain communities. So obviously, like when I talked to Senator Manchin's people, that's what I was focused on because are totally dependent on coal. Uh, so uh, that has to be integral. So we can't just say, get rid of fossil fuels. We say, get rid of fossil fuels, but uh, create new opportunities for workers and communities whose lives are dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, then to build the uh, clean energy alternative infrastructure uh, focused around um, renewable energy, solar, wind primarily, but not only, uh, and then uh, high efficiency, to raise efficiency standards in everything we do, 
in buildings, in transportation systems, in industry, uh, to invest in raising efficiency. So according to my own modeling, uh, I've costed that out. And my cost estimate is that it would take from now to 2050 to be at a zero fossil fuel economy, zero emissions economy, would take about two and a half percent of all global spending, global GDP, every year from now until 2050. So that, that was my own model. You know, my model could be wrong, of course. <coughs> but <clears throat> it turns out there were several other models uh, including the model by the International Energy Agency, it came out with essentially the same result. So, you know, I could be an idiot, they could be an idiot, but after three or four times, when people keep converging on more or less the same result, maybe we're not idiots. Uh, so roughly two and a half percent of GDP. Now that's a lot of money uh, because right now, you know, global GDP is 80 trillion. So, you know, we're looking at something like $3 trillion like this year and increasing amounts every year as the global economy grows. Uh, so it's a lot of money, it's a ton of money, but then again, it's not, right? It's not because it's 2.5%. That means 97.5% of all economic activity does not have to be focused on building a new clean energy infrastructure. So it's not like we have to shut down everything in order to build this alternative energy infrastructure. We do have to do two and a half percent. And by the way, the more we put it off, the higher the percentage has to be because we still have that 2050 goal. In fact, when I first started publishing stuff on this, yeah, the number was one and a half percent. We're up to two and a half percent. And I won't get into the details now, but to get to the 2030 goal, the short-term goal, is more than 2.5%, uh, then it levels off after that. Now, uh, who's doing this investment? Is it governments? Is it private businesses? It's both. It has to be both. That's my view. Uh, it has to be public investment-led. It has to be policies to incentivize private investors, and it's both. And by the way, speaking of operating within capitalism, it does create a lot of opportunity for all kinds of entities, including cooperatives, small scale businesses, uh, farmers to put up wind, uh, wind turbines on their land, dual use agriculture. Myself, and thank you for that introduction, I myself am a very small scale green energy capitalist. You can talk about that if you want later. Uh, but that, that will get us about 75% of the way uh, transforming the global energy system. It doesn't get us 100% of the way. The other 25% is focused around uh, forestry and agriculture. So we also need to stop destroying the Amazon rainforest, first and foremost. Uh, more generally, we need to stop deforestation reforestation, and we need to uh, stop industrial agriculture, which is so heavily dependent on fossil fuel energy. I'm gonna focus on the energy part as opposed to the agriculture forestry part, because that's the main story. Now, uh, this program, the Green New Deal, uh, can get us to zero emissions global economy, according to my own calculation, other people. Well, it does a lot of other good things. And that's the part where we call it a new deal. It's a green program. It's an egalitarian program. It's a jobs program. It's a public health program. And it's an opportunity for business. And so that's what I've listed out here. Uh, I'm going to show you some data on job creation. Uh, it is a way through which we can address uh, issues uh, macroeconomic instability and austerity, creating a growth agenda around a green transformation. And uh, obviously it will reduce uh, uh, pollution, which is a huge source of uh, 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 public health crises, especially 
large developing economies. And as I'm going to show you, it will, uh, it will um, lower the cost of energy. So one of the arguments against it is, well, how can we possibly afford this? And who wants to pay all this money for alternative energy? We already know. Well, actually, it's a lot cheaper. I'll show you. Um, OK. So and what about uh, capitalism? What is the relationship between capitalism and the crisis? Uh, as I already said, we have to solve the problem within capitalism. But is capitalism the cause? Uh, yes, in part, but not entirely, in my view. Um, in what sense? Well, if we think about the Industrial uh, Revolution, uh, fossil fuel energy, in particular, initially coal, was absolutely integral to the process. One of the big things that coal did was create an abundance of energy that wasn't uh, location specific. We already had energy sources. We already had windmills, wind turbines, right? Uh, we already had water power. In fact, water power was the initial source for the development of the textile industry in, in Britain. Okay. The, the problem with water power was be near the water source that could generate the turbines to move the turbines to generate the power to run machines. When you transition to coal, initially, coal was more expensive. Operating a factory with coal power was more expensive than operating with uh, water power, but it had the advantage that you didn't have to be location so that was advantageous to capitalists um, to get a workforce, to get people to show up at work. If you had to attract people to a specific water source, well, that meant that you had to bring them over, you had to pay them more. And uh, under a coal-based industrial system, you could set up a factory anywhere. And that gave uh, uh, business owners relative increase in bargaining power compared with their workers who uh, you no longer had to attract them from one location to another. And so that contributed to the uh, evocative phrase from Karl Marx, the Industrial Reserve Army of Labor. That is, how many people can you get to show up at a factory to do these really awful jobs? Uh, well, it became a lot easier under a coal-based uh, energy system because you didn't have to entice people to move near the water power. So yes, in that sense, uh, uh, capitalism is at the root cause of building a fossil fuel-dependent energy system, uh, number one. Uh, secondly, uh, if we want, if we want to choose one obstacle to uh, forward progress on climate. If we had to choose one, there are lots, but if we had to choose one, my one choice is oil companies. Why? Because they're making a ton of money. That's simple. They're making a ton of money off of selling us products that are destroying the I'm sure they care about the fact that we're just, they're destroying the planet, but in terms of their corporate model, they care more about making profits. And in fact, they're making huge profits right now. So if we look at the profits of the oil companies, the US oil companies right now, relative, not just during COVID, during COVID they did go down, right? Didn't drive as much, airlines were shut down. Universities were shut down. We were all online. So uh, we were consuming a lot less energy. Well, we're back now, so profits have gone up. But so therefore, what I, but I want to compare profits of the oil companies now relative to pre-COVID. So let's say January 2020, relative to now, 60% <coughs> increase. So they are jacking up their prices. They're earning monopoly profits. 
And you know what? They don't want to give that up. So that's the number one obstacle. And yes, that is right dead center uh, in terms of the logic of capitalism. Because what's the job of a corporate CEO? To make profits for shareholders. They want to do something that's sustainable, maybe okay, but that's not really their fundamental job. Fundamental job is to make money for their shareholders. If you're the CEO of an oil company, your fundamental job is to earn profits by selling oil, coal, and if you're in the uh, or oil, gas, and natural gas, uh, if you're or coal, if you're in the coal industry. Okay. So that said, uh, we are at. Uh, this huge inflection point now where the greatest single obstacle, in my view, to progress on climate is the interests of the oil company. Uh, at the same time, at the same time, you know, the economists uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, Harry Truman once said, find me an economist that only has one hand. Uh, so on the one hand, yes, the oil companies are the greatest single obstacle. On the other hand, guess what? 90% of fossil fuel assets globally are already publicly owned. So if we want to say public ownership is the solution to the climate crisis, problem solved. We're already there. Except we're not. Because guess who those companies are? Oh, you've heard about Putin. Well, Russia's fossil fuel industry is 100% publicly owned. Okay, Saudi Arabia, China, Iran, Brazil, Venezuela, they are all publicly owned. The fossil fuel assets are publicly owned. Now, they don't earn profits in the same way as ExxonMobil. But yes, Putin is financing his war on the basis of the revenue from selling oil and gas, especially in Europe. So public ownership uh, can be part of the solution. It is not the solution. Uh, and so you can see, uh, I would argue, and did argue and actually in a recent article, that in the US, public takeover of the oil companies would be hugely beneficial in eliminating that obstacle in the US to advancing a climate agenda uh, but only if, when we take over the oil companies, its purpose is exactly to advance our clean energy agenda. Its purpose cannot be to just uh, line the pockets of the friends of whoever the leading politicians happen to be at any given time. Okay, now let me, I'll give you some quick statistics on uh, the, the features of the program so you don't think I'm just making it all up and then I'll, I'll be done. Um, so as I said, burning of fossil fuels is responsible for about 75% of CO2 emissions. The, the globe consumes right now um, we consume uh, 485 quadrillion BTUs of fossil fuel energy. Uh, BTU, British Thermal Unit, okay, uh, that you can measure these uh, energy consumption in other ways. Uh, one, uh, one British Thermal Unit, one BTU, just to give you some scale. Light a match and burn it down to it burns your finger, that's one BTU. So the world runs now on 485 quadrillion of those matches getting lit, uh, okay? Uh, and that's about 80% of all energy consumption. Now, the plan that if we're going to be at zero, we have to be at zero. And so if we're going to be at zero by 2050, just do some simple arithmetic, that means we have to cut 18 quadrillion BTUs on average. And it's not that hard. If you think about it now, that is about three and a half percent. Now, the longer we put it off, obviously we got to cut more. But if we cut those 18 quadrillion BTUs, now every year we will be at zero by 2050. 
Very simple fourth grade arithmetic. Now, the uh, clean energy alternative. Obviously, if we're pulling out 18 quadrillion BTUs of energy from fossil fuels, we have to substitute something else. And that is, as I've said, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy. As according to my own calculations, that means, you know, yes, investing in electric cars. Uh, that means uh, increasing insulation in buildings, making sure all the lighting is LED lighting. That means increasing public transportation. That means riding your bikes when you can. Uh, and that means uh, building solar and wind power. It can be done. It, it is done in my own building at UMass Amherst, economics building, cold UMass Amherst, Amherst, Massachusetts. It's a zero emissions building. Every building should be a zero emissions building. It's, it can be done. Okay. Now, the other thing is people say, well, yeah, we can do it, but it entails huge sacrifices. Not true. You have to build the clean energy infrastructure, yes, but look at the cost figures on the uh, clean energy, and we'll just focus here on onshore wind and solar uh, PV, uh, photovoltaic panels, and you see these kind of brownish rectangles. Those, what you're looking at, are the cost range in the European countries uh, for fossil fuel energy to generate electricity. So uh, you can see, like, you know, here's that rectangle. It's between five and 15 cents to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity with fossil fuels. And what about wind and solar? Whoops, so wind and solar are cheaper. Now, wind and solar are cheaper than the average for fossil fuel energy. So onshore wind, here we are in 2010, down to 2020, it's at about uh, six to seven cents. Solar power used to be uh, much more expensive, about 35 cents, but it's come down dramatically. This is a major advance. Uh, solar power on average is now in the range also of six to seven cents. So solar energy, wind energy are cheaper cheaper than fossil fuel energy. Yes, you have to build the infrastructure. Obviously, you don't get the power. Once you create the infrastructure, there you are. Uh, and that is also true. These are figures now from the US Energy Department comparing solar and wind and geothermal with uh, coal and nuclear. This is coal with carbon capture, carbon capture technology the way through which you keep burning fossil fuels, but you pull the carbon out before it pollutes the atmosphere. And you can see that solar and wind, according to the US Energy Department, are about half. This is according to the US Energy Department, are about half of uh, fossil. Okay, now uh, there are a lot of uh, proponents of nuclear energy because nuclear energy um, does generate electricity uh, without creating CO2 emissions. But as you saw, nuclear is more expensive at 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour. And it's also really dangerous. If you followed the war, one of the first things that Putin did was invade Chernobyl and Zaporizhia uh, where we have the two biggest nuclear power plants in Europe and the threat that uh, once he had control of those, uh, he was going to use them to release radioactivity. Um, there's no way around that. If you're going to produce energy from uh, nuclear power, you are going to face these dangers of uh, public safety and of whatever, I mean, we already seen what happened with Putin, but uh, terrorist organizations can also get access uh, to this uh, nuclear energy and maybe build a bomb, but even if they don't build a bomb, release radioactivity 
uh, as, a, as a political threat. So I myself don't favor nuclear as an alternative to fossil fuel energy. Okay, jobs, and I'll uh, just do this quickly. One of the things that we've shown in our research is building a clean energy economy is good for jobs. The uh, perspective had been prevalent that yes, you can uh, save the planet if you're interested in that, but you're gonna, it means sacrificing jobs uh, because it means that you're gonna have to have more expensive energy, that the fossil fuel jobs are gonna go away. <coughs> well, the fossil fuel jobs will go away, but we will be creating jobs to build the alternative energy system. And here are just some very rough uh, averages on, uh, from different countries where we've done research, myself and coworkers. And just look at this column, the last column. What we see is that the clean energy investments generate, roughly speaking, two to three times more jobs per given amount of spending, per dollar of expenditure. You will get more jobs, not less jobs. You will get more jobs. So if we're talking about a Green New Deal, job creation as a centerpiece, this is a way to advance job opportunities. And once you create the job opportunities in a way through which you can advance good jobs through uh, promoting unionization, uh, job training, affirmative action, and so forth. Okay, so uh, there will be job losses in the fossil fuel industry, and that's why at the very beginning I said, integral to any Green New Deal is addressing the problems of job loss and community loss, phasing out the fossil fuel. This is true. Let's say you don't care at all about the workers or communities, let's say in West Virginia. Uh, you might not care at all, but if you do care about the climate crisis and solving it, uh, you will face you know, overwhelming political resistance from the workers and the communities unless you have a program to address their concerns, which are legitimate concerns. So that's why I say that the transition, which includes pension guarantees, employment guarantees, retraining and relocation has to be integral to any Green New Deal uh, worthy of its name. Okay, I, I do, I'm not gonna go through these, uh, but I did do a study for New York State. Uh, it came out in 2017 on exactly these points, just to show you very quickly. So here's the energy efficiency investments, renewable energy investments. I show you just so you think I'm not making it all up. Uh, and then we have those investments, the investments become jobs. So we estimate the jobs from all of these activities, such as retrofitting buildings, electrical grid upgrade, public transportation expansion, wind and solar. Here's all the jobs. The bottom line is for New York State, as of our study, you're gonna get about 200,000 jobs in New York State. And that's about two and a half percent of the New York State workforce. So it's significant. It's not 5%, it's not 10%, but 2.5% is a lot. If you say we have a 7% unemployment rate in New York, let's say, well now under this program, your steady state unemployment level is gonna be 4.5% instead of 7%. That's significant. That's what you get through advancing this clean energy program, program. And then I also estimated the job losses in the fossil fuel industry in New York State. And it turns out, this was as of, well, the most recent data was 2014. I'm sure it's a little bit different now, but you get the basic idea. There's about 13,000 people in New York State who are dependent on the fossil fuel industry. Again, it may have changed a little bit, not much. Um, that's not very many. When we're talking about the 200,000 jobs that are gonna get created, there's 13,000 that are dependent. But more importantly, when you boil it down and you say, we're phasing out the industry gradually, year to year. So what we estimated 
uh, through 2030 is the average annual job losses is only about 500. Then when you do a demographic analysis of who those 500 people are, well, a lot of them are 55 and older. So we say, well, voluntarily retirements uh, are probably going to be, uh, as you can see, around 469. Uh, so that the people that we estimated, this is 2017, the people we estimated that would lose their jobs um, and need another job, not retire. It's like, it's less than 100 people in New York State, less than 100 people a year. So when you hear these arguments, uh, this is gonna be devastating for workers and community, it's not really critical. It's not even gonna be that in West Virginia. It is, these are people with jobs and incomes, communities, but it's a small number. So uh, we estimated that a program at $300,000 per worker for everything, would uh, amount to $18 million a year, which is peanuts for New York. The just transition as an integral part of the program can happen. It should happen, has to happen, not just in New York, but in every state. So finally, uh, just to say another state, I did do a study that came out about 10 months ago, California. And this one, just to show you where the uh, level of interest is, uh, this is a program that's actually endorsed by most of the unions in New York, uh, in California, sorry. Because it's a jobs program and because there's a just transition component getting to zero emissions. So climate stabilization is an opportunity to create jobs and to address the concerns of people that are gonna lose their jobs. And because uh, the study showed that, we did get the endorsement of most of the uh, union movement in California, including, including the oil refinery workers. The oil refinery workers who will all lose their jobs endorsed the study because we took seriously the idea of just transition. And this is a quote from the vice president of the Oil Refinery Workers Union uh, saying, uh, we don't believe, we aren't gonna believe these things until they pass. Uh, you can see what he says. Uh, but uh, with a fully funded equitable transition plan, we can jumpstart recovery and move California's workers, communities, and the planet towards a more secure future. This is from the leader of the Oil Refinery Workers in California. And in the spirit of him, Norm Rogers, uh, this is how I think we can understand the Green New Deal as a program to save the planet and to build a more just, equitable society. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob, for the, for the presentation. We will take a, a brief break, somewhere, somewhere between five and ten minutes, um, and then we'll come back, and my colleagues will sit down with Bob. They'll have some informal conversation and also Q&A from our students who have been preparing for this for many days and will be ready to ask questions, right? See you all. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, Bob, for the presentation. It, you know, there's the old uh, saying about tree planting. Uh, some of you may know this one. Um, when's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. Second best time is today. Okay, and that, that does apply to the message that Bob just communicated to us. So um, the students here, are, of course, know Dr. Gutman and Dr. Zimmerman, but let me just very briefly introduce Dr. Gutman, who is professor of economics, and uh, Dr. Zimmerman, who is a professor in the English department. Both have written extensively on climate-related issues from the perspective of their respective fields. 
So uh, we're going to let them engage in an informal conversation for 15 or 20 minutes, and then the floor will be open to all of you in the audience. We have microphones. We will carry the mics to you. You don't have to get up. You don't have to wait. Just put up your hand. Okay, so uh, please join me in, in welcoming the panel for the second part. Are we starting the informal part now? Okay. okay. Well, thank you, uh, and uh, uh, informally speaking, um, you put the uh, reduction of the burning of fossil fuel at the center of the problem. Um, and a question I have is, what is the mechanism by which you're suggesting that happen? You've, um, you've stressed the investment in uh, renewables and efficiency, but those of themselves don't automatically mean the reduction of burning of fossil fuel, history tells us. Uh, you have raised the possibility of nationalizing uh, the oil industry, uh, pointing out that that is a uh, insufficient measure. It would depend upon what the nationalized power does. Um, my question is, if it's if it's not a necessary measure, as opposed to an insufficient, a sufficient measure, if it's not a necessary measure, what is the mechanism by which uh, enforcement of the drastic and sufficient reduction of fossil fuel can happen? Well, you know, there's a whole array of out there. Um, yes, yeah, so. Uh, we agree, or I, I did write this article, came out a few weeks ago, saying, and I, I certainly not originally, uh, that uh, government takeover of at least the largest oil companies would clear out a lot of the political opposition, because as I said during the talk, if I had to pick one thing that is an obstacle, it's the fact that Oil companies are making a ton of money off of destroying the planet. And they're, they may feel a little bit badly about it, but maybe not so bad. So, uh, yes, that would be part of this. And, but we're dealing with political reality, so we have to also think about other possibilities. Yeah. So one of them so is, you know, there are called renewable portfolio standards. Another way to just say the same thing, less fancy, is just putting caps, legal caps, on how much fossil fuel can be burned. So, uh, you know, let's say, you know, I showed you that number, 486 quadrillion BTUs of fossil fuel energy being consumed now. So let's say every year we have to cut it by 20. Now that's globally, so it's hard to think about a global uh, legal mechanism, but within the United States, and we're at about 25% of that total. So you just set the, the mechanism. Every year, we have to cut by five quadrillion BTUs of, of fossil fuel consumption. It's just the law. And we, ha we do have uh, precedents for that. So New York State, uh, it has what it calls these renewable portfolio standards, which says by X year, we are going to substitute out fossil fuel energy and put in renewable energy. And it's a, it's a simple point. The problem that I experienced when I wrote that study for New York State, I looked into it because you had this standard that by 2015, New York State was going to be 29% renewable. Um, it, but it was not mandatory. There was no legal enforcement mechanism. 2015 came and went, and you didn't hit the target. There was no press conference, there was no nothing. Right. There wasn't a single article in the press, I think I wrote one in 2017, and before that there wasn't anything. So if you're gonna have the, obviously if you're going to have these requirements, these mandates, they're not any good unless they're enforced. 
So that's when we talked about this a little last night, is it how do you enforce it? Well, why not say the CEO of the utility goes to jail uh, if they don't hit the target? So that is another way. You know, a third way related is the so-called carbon tax. So rather than putting a cap, a legal cap, you say you just keep taxing uh, so you increase the, increase the price. So we're already experiencing that now with you know gas at the pump twice what it was two years ago. Um, how much have we cut back on consumption? Not very much. But let's say instead of $4 a gallon, it was $10 a gallon. Um, then you would start to see substitution. And the other benefit of a tax is that you get the revenue, you can give money back to people, but the people can then spend it on, you know, renewable energy, uh, and they would move, and, and we also spend some of it on investing, subsidizing the solar wind efficiency. And so, you know, it's, it's all of the above, it's a combination, and, you know, Biden's initial Build Back Better program it was pretty good with the combination. The, you know, Bernie Sanders introduced one before Biden, and that was very close to this thing that I mentioned, the Thrive program. That was better, but it didn't pass. It didn't come close, even though, yes, Chuck Schumer and Elizabeth Warren, they were at the press conference introducing this. So a lot of it is getting the, you know, the political mobilization, and I hope the people, you students, are going to lead it. That's who we need. Right. Uh, I have a question about the, the viability of solar and wind in light of the fact that they're intermittent suppliers. They're not, they're not continuous suppliers yet. And uh, there's often an argument being made that we need some kind of backup operation yeah. besides smart grids. And my question is, are there any prospects for this for smart grids to become so smart that they can even out and more more easily uh, the uneven supplies? Yeah. As well as, what would be the backup in the, in the interim period, in the transition period? Because let's say in France, for example, which I follow closely, the, the, the nuclear industry is very powerful there, and they make an argument that they're the perfect backup. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I can see that in a number of countries. Uh, the, the nuclear power industry is using this, this, this sort of back door to sneak itself back into an expansion yeah. that has been kind of forestalled in many countries. And I was yeah. wondering how, how you see this. Well, this is a definite problem, and I, I didn't get into it, but I hope I didn't convey the idea that, that renewable solar and wind is a panacea. It's not. There's, there's huge challenges. It's just, in my opinion, the challenges of those are less than everything else, including nuclear. So, uh, right, if we're at, as globally, we're at, let's say, roughly 500 quadrillion BTUs, we're consuming of fossil fuel energy. Um, as we transition, at, let's say ambitiously, to building out a high efficiency renewable uh, dominant energy system, at least for the next decade or so, we will still be burning fossil fuels. So the issue, of, as Robbie says, intermittency meaning that the sun isn't shining all day and the wind isn't blowing all day and what happens when they're not. So uh, yes, we need a backup. So at least for a decade, we will be able to still use the fossil fuels as part of it as they're phased out. Uh, I am not opposed to using the existing nuclear infrastructure. I'm not, I am opposed to thinking of nuclear as a major part of the long-term solution. And so, you know, the idea of shutting down existing nuclear power plants uh, while they're still operable, I think we have to really consider those case by case. Um, so uh, nuclear can be part of a backup. And also uh, there are um, non-intermittent sources of renewable energy, such as geothermal. So that I mentioned my own building, the economics building at UMass, we, have, we run on geothermal and solar. We have geothermal pits. And UMass, by the way, the, our chancellor announced on Earth Day that we're going to be 100% clean energy in 10 years. Costa should do the same thing. And geothermal is a big part of the solution for, for UMass. 
Um, so geothermal, um, some forms of oh, well, hydropower, uh, small-scale hydropower is not intermittent, it's constant. And bioenergy, if it can be done uh, with low emissions, is also non-intermittent. So it's that combination. And then over time, so we have a decade or two, over time, as, as you know, there's a lot of research going on with respect to storage and battery technology. And that's, that's in a much earlier stage than, say, solar. Um, so I can't say that we have the solution for that. But I'm confident in 10, 15 years we will with the right incentives. I mean, like I showed you, only a decade ago it cost 35 cents to generate one kilowatt power uh, electricity through, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> through solar. Now it's six cents. Thank you, China. That comes from China. Um, so this notion that we're going to try to enforce a legal cap, um, that does depend upon, of course, an indirect mechanism by hoping this essentially legal deterrence works. Um, and it, um, and these market mechanisms work. You know, given the, as you amply described, the utter urgency of the problem, and given the, um, the fact that, you know, a third of the way isn't sufficient in time, um, I'm wondering um, what's the argument for these indirect methods rather than what you've argued elsewhere is the more direct method, which is nationalizing the industries and taking the actions that have to be done, rather than hoping that people will care enough not to go to jail. Because once you put them in jail, that's too late. Mm. Good point. Uh, you know, here we're at the level of politics. <coughs> as, I, as I mentioned, you know, I, I briefly went over some of those numbers I did for New York State, mm -hmm. but I did, and, and I mentioned in California, and I got endorsed. I did one for West Virginia, similar, and I had a very nice Zoom meeting with Manchin and the staff. Very nice, yeah, great, really interesting, and then nothing. So, I mean, what a, I don't know, you know, what are the, what are the ways that we can actually make this happen? I mean, we came pretty close with Build Back Better. Right. There was, you know, there was a lot of optimism. The Green New Deal Network is a great coalition, including mm -hmm. Sierra Club, uh, um, Working Families Party mm -hmm. here in New York. And they, and I, I did work with them too, and, and they, you know, they did their overambitious right. version knowing that it would get cut back. Right. But the fact is, they did get Chuck Schumer, you know, the Senate Majority Leader at the time, and still today, at the press conference endorsing their program. And then, you know, then we can't even get the Biden one done. Right. So, yeah, yeah whatever... I mean, the political we, question is certainly yeah, part of it. Yeah, so, and I, of course, yeah. I would love to... I, I mean, I think it's obscene. I, I think it's immoral. I mean, how can these oil companies keep... Um, Making money. Up. What, what if instead of saying we need to, we need to uh, head off a threat to security, or uh, we need to um, work towards sustainability, if we said we need to not kill billions of people? What if that were part of the way we talked about this issue? Might that? I think that. Yeah. I mean, I because that's yeah. not how it's talked about in most of the discourse that you've quoted. Uh -huh. yeah. um, sure. Okay. That's good. I mean, you're the English professor. So you know well, right that's irrelevant to, to yeah. That's irrelevant <laughs> to the degree to which the way we talk about things yeah. shapes that's, the, I how we understand them politically. Very fair point. Yeah. You know, I've done a lot of, the last couple of years especially, mm -hmm. I've got these studies like New York, I've done nine US states uh, I just did one for South Korea. I'm doing one for Greece. 
I'm doing other stuff with the UN. So, uh, yeah, how do we mobilize? And to me, one of the, the most exciting parts was getting this breakthrough in California. Mm -hmm. the, the oil refinery workers. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you give us a just transition, we're, we're with you. Um, if we can move in that direction, and to, if you can tell me the right way to say it, to persuade more, I will put you right there and I'll put your picture on speak the cover. Of, speak of atrocities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Routinely in your public announcement. Uh, all right, fair enough. I mean, there's all kinds of it's comparisons. All, I, I've learned something right now and I will start doing it and I will quote you as I fairly should. I have another question. That might not be a good idea. So I've been following climate policy in other countries, and uh, one of the differences between several of those and the U.S. is that several of those, in particular the within the European Union, but also now increasingly in China, there's in Canada too. There's a, this issue of the carbon price, and there's a lot of discussion about it, right? And you have also had like you know views of policy in that direction, either through the the cap and trade, the carbon markets, and the European Union now is like 90, 90 euros uh, per ton. That's a high price. That's kind of what the scientists think is necessary. Uh, Sweden has a carbon tax of 126 uh, euros uh, per ton. And these are, I mean, here it's like, you do that to kill the carbon. But these countries have thrived, if not, you know. And if you argue within with solving this problem within capitalism, you need to disincentivize, but also by pricing. So my question is, why, why do you not enter that question into the U.S.? I'm not against it. Uh, that, as I said, you know, we can think mm -hmm. about nationalization. We can think about caps, cap and trade. Mm -hmm. I don't like the trade part of cap and trade because mm -hmm. that it creates all kinds of opportunities for avoidance. Yes. Uh, and that's really it's created a massive global market for avoidance. Um, so cap, yes. And where we set the cap and how aggressively we set it, how we enforce it. Um, but if you want to do it through price, I mean, there's positives and negatives. I'm, I'm, I'm not against it. And, you know, if you look at my study, for example, for New York State or other states, I include the uh, carbon pricing, the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. Again, it's really, I'm not, uh, it's not a question of having it or not having it. It has to be set high enough so that it really makes a difference. And uh, so we can also then, with the carbon tax, we can generate revenue. Some of it goes back to people so that they aren't hurt, yeah. low income people especially, but uh, some of it then goes into subsidizing the, the mm -hmm. renewable energy investments. So I'm pretty ecumenical. And I think that we have to take all of these seriously, including uh, you know positive incentives, such as talking about pricing. Uh, so it's so it's called feed-in tariff policy, mm -hmm. which is a policy which guarantees investors a long-term price if you're going to invest in renewable energy. Again, being myself a tiny green energy capitalist, that's how I make deals. I do deals with mainly with nonprofits, mm -hmm. like say a church. And we put the solar panels on the roof, and I own the solar panels, and I sell it to the church. And the reason it works for both of us is because as a, as a capitalist, a private company, I get the benefit, uh, the tax benefits that they can't get. Mm -hmm. So I can pass on the tax benefits to them, but the deal is we have a fixed price. Mm -hmm. So I know I put up the solar panels, I'm gonna get this price for 10 years. So, yeah, I, that's a good policy, too. Um, moving back out to the large question about capitalism per se, uh, you've suggested, on the one hand, that uh, we have capitalism and we have to solve the problem within the existing power structures. Touche. Um, on the other hand, you've acknowledged that the essential logic of capitalism is... Uh, Ecocidal insofar as it well, will kill everything for its own profit. I mean, so we have what you've defined and others as the you know basic logic of capitalism, and yet working within capitalism, the framework. So my question has to do with what do we mean by capitalism when we talk about 
the, within the framework of capitalism. Mm. That looks like something very different than one that is guided by that exploitative logic. Yeah. Well, you know, there are different versions of capitalism. And so Ravi just mentioned Sweden. Mm -hmm. I had a great professor at graduate school named Robert Heilbrenner. Some of you may have heard of him. I know you have. And he had a wonderful phrase that he often used in talking about his, his vision of a decent society. And he called it slightly imaginary Sweden. So it wasn't the real Sweden. It was better than the real Sweden. But it captured some of the things that fairly Sweden has accomplished. And if, we had, if I had to pick one country that has made significant progress on climate, it's Sweden. No surprise, because they've done a lot of Have their emissions things. gone down? Yeah, they are, you know, in terms of consumption, consumption base? Absolute decoupling. Yes. Uh, I mean, not to the sufficient degree, but they, you know, their economy is growing, their emissions are down, their fossil fuel consumption is down. So consumption based. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So I don't think that they're ideal by any means, but they're a different version of capitalism. And they are along other dimensions, you know, as a as a society that addresses the other features of the of the you know the Green New Deal that we didn't talk about uh, mm -hmm. in terms of you know universal health care, child care, elder care, public transportation, and on and on. Okay. Sweden is way ahead of okay. the U.S. Okay. and ahead of most of Europe. So it's a nice model. It's not perfect. No, we're close, but. If, if we can get to slightly imaginary. Yeah. What so qualifies it as capitalism? Well, private ownership of most of the means of production. Wealth inequality is is as as bad as, as this country. Mm. Interestingly, mm. Uh, income inequality is much more equal because they have a lot of redistributive policies. And, you know, tax rates are fifty five percent, and they redistribute, and they run a universal health care system. And college education is free. Mm. So it's still capitalism. And uh, yeah, businesses are still in, in, in the interest of making profit. Uh, but it is a more restrained version. So that's what. How many, have any of you ever heard of Bob Hunt, Robert Heilbrunner? Okay. Great man. Uh, yeah, you knew him, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is it, is it time to hear I have one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I was going to ask you about the financing aspect. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, you know, you spend like maybe half a percent of GDP now. You want to do a two and a half percent. Right. I mean, you know, we're talking about several trillion dollars. Right, right. And, and, you know, I've been working in climate finance, as you know. Yeah. And, and, but I was wondering, I mean, I've never really talked to you about that. I know that you, you know, you have some opinions about that. And I read your book. Thank you. Uh, I actually reviewed your book. I know. <laughs> no, but the question is this: uh, Look, like in the U.S., you have you have a very powerful finance sector, and it's it's not necessarily easily going to go from shareholder value maximization to ESG to environmental social governance. There's a there's a there's a long-standing tradition of boo-booing public debt and national debt and saying that we cannot afford this. And deficit spending, you can't do that. And there's inflation, and inflation may be lasting for a while, you know, given the structural nature of it. So, how do you see the transition unfold from that aspect of the financing question? So, um, so let's see. Okay, uh, let me just first start with some big number. Uh, and I just was teaching it in my introduction macroeconomics class yesterday, uh, talking about uh, Federal Reserve policy during COVID. During the, you know, from March 2020 to December 2021, the U.S. Federal Reserve bought uh, bonds, stocks, derivatives from fine, uh, Wall Street, $4 trillion at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. 99% of the population doesn't even know that, that the Federal Reserve completely bailed out Wall Street in a matter of months. If they can come up with $4 trillion 
in 18 months to buy mortgage-backed securities, to buy stocks, to buy treasuries, and I'm talking about in the U.S., something like one-tenth of that uh, a year. So there's a solution right there. And, you know, so we issued, municipalities could issue green bonds. Mm -hmm. And the Fed could buy them. Maybe not all of them. Wall Street can buy some of them. They can be subsidized by, uh, Wall by the Fed. They can be subsidized by the federal government. Um, China does that already. Yeah. Well, and you can see, I mean, China is, you know, kind of schizophrenic in that yeah. they are by far the biggest source of emissions. They're also by far the biggest source of low-cost solar panels. Um, and green bonds, too. Yeah. So uh, that's a solution right there. Uh, it, you know, if we're going to go with a carbon tax, as I said, carbon tax, you know, my colleague at UMass Amherst, Jim Boyce, to develop this idea of carbon tax. He calls it carbon tax and dividend. An easier way, I think, to think of it is a rebate. You pay at the pump, then you get the money back, and uh, that would be an egalitarian program, and there would also be money for financing uh, the Green New Deal. Another simple way, you know, we are at $800 billion per year military budget. If we're thinking about, if we truly think of the military budget as, as protecting our long-term security, well, we have a climate crisis that is uh, facing ecological disaster. So politically, what if we took 10% of that? Uh, that's $80 billion right there. So there's a lot of ways to think about financing within capitalism. I, like I said, the Fed came up with eight, with $4 trillion in no time. Um, I actually, we had Janet Yellen, when she was the chair of the Fed, come, she came to UMass, uh, and I had lunch with her, and I asked her about this. I said, How can, you, can you do green bond financing? And she said, yeah, sure, the Fed can do anything. Right. By the way, I wasn't supposed to tell you that. This was an okay. off-the-record conversation. <laughs> oh, well. And she's still uh, the secretary of That's right. Now. Yeah. But isn't that usually called socialism for the rich? So is no, it capitalism? It's, yeah. Is yeah. it capitalism? Yeah. Socialized rich. Right? Yeah, yeah. Is it capitalism? Yeah. Yes, it is. it is. Well, uh, if, if, thank mm -hmm. you for citing my another article I yeah. wrote of several months ago. It was exactly called Neoliberalism's Bailout Problem, and I called these bailouts, what the Wall Street, what the Fed did for Wall Street, I call it champagne socialism. Right? Uh, Which is also capitalism? It is, is capitalism, for, it's <laughs> low risk capitalism for Wall Street and high risk capitalism for everybody else. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the money can be found. And by the way, there's not, so, you know, taxing the rich and also uh, deficit spending are, are not, not such a big thing. It's fine. I mean, the, even with all the deficit spending that we've done over the last two years, um, the interest payments that the government is now paying on our government debt is close to historic low, not a high, uh, because we've done it at low interest rates. We've borrowed at low interest rates. The Fed can move the, the treasury rates, the rates at which the government borrowed, down to very low levels. We've seen that. And they can do that, therefore, for green bonds. They could target green bonds. A municipality puts up, or yeah, uh, New York City uh, issues green bonds. Let's say the Fed buys half of them, or a third of them. Uh, that would lower the interest rate on the bond. And that, therefore, it makes it much easier to finance these things. So the financing, there's, there's technical things, but the basic issues are, are not that difficult. Very good. Okay, so thank you, thank the three of you for getting us started. And now it is your turn, students. Um, if Tahia and Peggy Ann will have the microphones, they will bring them to you. All you need to do is raise your hands, okay? Hi, thank you so much for the talk. It was fantastic. But um, when we think about the climate crisis, it can, it, we can often feel very small as students. Um, 
Hi, I'm over here. Oh, Sorry. There you are. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. So it's it's easy for us to feel so small because we have these massive corporations that are, you know, you feel powerless. So what do you suggest for us students to be able to do right now in taking action because mm. to combat that feeling of being so small? I will give you a good example because I'll reference my own university. Uh, and on Earth Day, our chancellor announced that UMass Amherst is going to be at zero emissions by 2032 in 10 years. And here's how that happened. Uh, we have a very good chancellor, just like you have an excellent new president. And he formed a committee of faculty members, uh, staff, students, uh, administrators to discuss this issue of how we address the question, you know, very broadly. And basically, this committee was a talking shop and not going anywhere for months and months and months. It was really boring uh, and it was a waste of time. So then the students uh, went and met with the chancellor and they told them that this committee was accomplishing zero. And, you know, the climate crisis is real, and how come we hear, keep hearing excuses uh, instead of action? And the chancellor said, I agree with you. Uh, and therefore, he then mandated our committee to not come up with excuses, but to come up with a plan. And the outcome of that, of his decision, forced on him by the students, was that in, you know this large institution, UMass Amherst, is going to be at zero emissions in 10 years. And I did talk to your president about this briefly, and I think he should do the exact same thing. And I think every single university, college, can do the exact same thing. And so not only do you, of course, reduce your emission, but you engage on, uh, on the debate. It spills into the community and you become the moral force, the leadership in advancing the, a very clear solution. Now, let me just contrast that with something else which a lot of campuses have done, which is divestment. So divesting ownership in stocks and bonds owned by fossil fuel companies. And I really applaud the spirit. I don't know if you've done it here on this campus. I applaud the spirit, but it doesn't accomplish anything or very little. It, it does raise uh, consciousness, but basically it means, okay, we're gonna sell our stocks in ExxonMobil, and so then a private equity company is gonna buy them, and then they get to make the profits. So if we're gonna go for all out effort, don't just stop with divestment. Uh, just say we are gonna get off fossil fuel and, and do it and enforce it. And I think, to me, that's the single best thing that can, college students can be on their campuses uh, to really uh, take leadership. Beyond that, um, you know, it's young people like yourselves that have, you know, raised the issue to an extent that it had been ignored. I mean, of course, we know about Greta, uh, who is fantastic, uh, but it's not just her. Uh, you know, there was a climate strike here in New York uh, City a few weeks ago. I actually spoke by Zoom, and I know at this one high school, Manhattan um, in Institute for Science and Math, which is in Harlem, it's the biggest high school in Harlem, the students went on strike um, and raised consciousness that way and educated themselves. So uh, I would say those are some of the things. Once we move into the, you know, the real grown-up politics and all that, you know, it becomes a meat grinder and all the great programs um, get watered down and it gets discouraging. And so that therefore direct action like saying Hofstra University is going to be at zero by 2032 and um, speak to your president about that. And she can follow, the U UMass has already done it. I think some other places have done it. It's a great thing to do, and it is, uh, it's doable, and it really, really embeds your community in ways that will resonate more broadly.
Hello. Um, so t thinking of the three major topics of the climate crisis, the social justice problem and the income gap, considering there's this big plan made to fix the climate crisis, does that make it like an easier problem to solve in comparison to the income gap and the, and the um, social justice problems or are they three incomparable problems in general? Well, I think they're really interrelated. That's why you know, the notion of the Green New Deal tries to capture a climate stabilization path that is consistent with advancing greater equality and social justice. And it doesn't solve it all by itself, obviously. So you saw, I mean, my projection for New York State is it creates 200,000 jobs. That's a lot of jobs. That's good. We don't know if they're good jobs. But it, uh, it does create opportunities for union organizing. And if there's a big public sector component, you can ha enforce uh, labor standards and improve the quality of jobs. It still is not, I mean, the level of income inequality, you know, it, it's just breathtaking. That's, you know, when I showed you the chart showing that from 1980 on, the, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, the global mean temperature has gone up from 0 0.2 to 1, 1 1.2. Well, you know, another thing started then in 1980, and that was basically neoliberal version of capitalism, which was much more aggressively pro-capitalist and anti-worker. So that, you know, from 19, roughly from 1973 to the present, the average non-supervisory worker's wage has been flat. And now that's for almost 50 years, flat. Productivity has gone up two and a half tons. Income is, is flat. So productivity means that the income pie is growing. And if the worker gets the same flat number, somebody is getting the rest. And that's why, you know, if you look at corporate CEOs, corporate CEOs in 1970 were making about, um, uh, 20 times what an average worker makes, and now they make 200 times. So they were making, a, the average worker makes 50,000, the average CEO is making a million and a half. The average worker makes 50,000 now, the average CEO makes 15 million. That's what's happened over the course of these last 40 to 50 years. So the climate, solving the climate crisis, I think can push us in the right direction, doing things like nationalizing the fossil fuel industry and eliminating profits from that can push us in the right direction, but it's not the solution in and of itself. Um, so we have to be able to do uh, several things to address not just the climate crisis, but also the massive increase in inequality. One of them is to empower workers. And this is one way to empower workers. That's why I was really excited to see that the, in California, mm -hmm. especially that the working class movement is really behind this Green New Deal idea. Hi. Um, ooh, wow. Okay. Um, my question is regarding net zero and reaching that goal by 2050. Does that factor in any emissions that would result from production that is outsourced? So the net zero, and by the way, you guys should uh, the net zero is a global number. It doesn't matter if we get to net zero and nobody else does. So that zero is now, then the question is what do we mean by net? So that's a, that is a nice wiggle number that allows for cheating because if you say that you, uh, you're going to actually keep burning fossil fuels, but we get the net through uh, these techniques like carbon capture or even um, aerosol injections into the atmosphere. So it becomes really fuzzy. I myself favor not net zero, absolute zero. Mm. And, uh, and yes, if, you know what, if some of the, we haven't, if we can talk about it, but if some of these technologies for uh, 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 carbon absorption work, in 25 years, and they really work? Okay, uh, but we don't know that. There's no evidence that they work. Uh, we have one form of carbon capture and sequestration that works. That is 
growing trees. And so let's, yes, uh, advance reforestation. But beyond that, I think we have to go to absolute zero in the United States and globally. And by the way, that if we say we have to be at zero globally, that also kind of clears up a lot of ambiguity. Um, we're talking, uh, Professor Zimmerman talking about, are we talking about consumption-based or production-based levels in Sweden of, of CO2? It doesn't matter if you're going to go to zero. Uh, yeah, consumption and production, zero, zero, zero. Uh, no burning fossil fuels. Uh, that has to be the goal. And like I said, uh, in 25 years, if we have this brilliant technology that can capture some of the carbon, okay, so far there's no evidence that that works. And by the way, the fossil fuel companies have massive incentives to get these technologies to work. Mm -hmm. And they haven't succeeded. This has been decades. We still don't have a carbon capture technology that is at commercial scale. None. And this is, I don't know how much Bill Gates has put into it. Uh, tens of billions. Um, we still don't have it. We know, you saw the solar, you know, three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. It works. It's not fancy. Putting in LED lights, they work. Hello. Um, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Pollan. Uh, do you think that we can reach carbon neutrality without reducing our consumption and without changing our habits drastically? I'm talking especially about the top 10% who are responsible for the 50% of all carbon emissions. So I guess what are your thoughts on degrowth strategies? And I know that you've uh, referenced Sweden, but I must emphasize that most of their goods are imported from the global south. And in fact, global north uh, emits 92% of all carbon emissions by exploiting the more uh, vulnerable areas. So uh, I, don't, I don't disagree with you know, the numbers. And again, it depends if we if we want to measure our consumption level within a country or production level within a country. So in terms of uh, uh, production level, the, the biggest source of emissions right now by far is China. So uh, we could say, well, it's not fair to impose on China because we, in the US, for example, we import a lot of things from China. So that should be put on us in the US. And uh, I would say, I would like to circumvent that debate by saying we all get to zero. Sweden, China, the US, every Kenya, we all get to zero. Um, and that's the way in which I think we can uh, avoid having these debates. Now, what about uh, uh, the levels of consumption of rich people and changing lifestyles? I, there's certainly a role for that. I don't think it's a major role myself uh, because um, most of the world's population, I mean, 70% of the world's population lives on less than $10 a day. And I don't want to be in a position to say that, you know, your living standard has to stabilize. Uh, and so that I am going to favor uh, expanding uh, life opportunities for most of the world's population. But wasn't the question about the the top 10%. The top, yeah, yeah, I'll get there. Yeah. So uh, the, the question then, for example, I mean, in my little company, uh, one of the things we're doing now is uh, trying to develop um, solar energy um, in uh, rural Burundi, sub-Saharan Africa. So that, that's where I, I, I don't want to be able to say <coughs> that we, we, global society, have to cut back on our consumption. Uh, rich people, yes, okay. Uh, rich people uh, are the source of most of emissions, um, as you noted. So what do we do about it? Um, I think that the, you know, it, raising energy efficiency standards and converting to renewable energy 
will address the problem of rich people's CO2 consumption, just like it will address the issues with respect to everybody else. If we can uh, fly airplanes, if we can have um, uh, ocean liners uh, running on renewable energy and high efficiency, um, then that doesn't, uh, that we don't have to change our consumption patterns per se. We have to change our consumption patterns for other reasons. Uh, I think we have to drastically reduce inequality. Uh, as I said, you know, even in the United States under capitalism, the levels of inequality 40, 50 years ago were infinitesimally smaller relative to what they are now. And that has created, and I think in your course, maybe you're covering it, it's created all sorts of problems with respect to overrepresentation of power in politics by the rich. So those are all fundamental problems that result from inequality. And I think that there is some small contribution that we can accomplish through reducing consumption patterns of rich people, but I think we should just generally have a more egalitarian society for a lot of reasons. And in, when we do that, we still, if we don't change our energy system, we will not solve climate change. We have to just stop burning fossil fuels, period. Rich, for rich people, for everybody else. And so I think for the climate crisis, that's to me the, the fundamental solution. And you asked about degrowth, and we could get into that a lot. Um, I say degrow the fossil fuel industry to zero, as I've said, but then we're gonna expand the renewable energy, the clean energy, um, you know, many, many fold relative to where it is. Clean energy is maybe 5% of all energy uh, production in the world now. It has to be at 85, 90%. And so that, is that degrowth? Actually, no. Well, what about the issue of absolute energy usage growing or not? Yeah, so basically, it, and it, I, I referenced my own model. Um, I, my model assumes that absolute energy consumption uh, falls. Um, by about uh, a half a percent mm -hmm. per year through efficiency. And uh, that is uh, technologically reasonable from my understanding of the literature. So that it, by 2050, basically the global, globe is consuming less energy from any energy source, but let's call it energy services, what you get from energy, what people in sub-Saharan Africa get from being able to light their homes, the energy services are, are going to go up. So that's the way in which I would Okay, we have time for one last question. Hi, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, very, you know, interesting things to think about. Um, I, you presented a statistic during your presentation about um, the amount of jobs that would be lost, particularly in New York State. Um, and just to remain within uh, the Rust Belt for the sake of argument, um, I was very kind of curious if you really believe that a lot of these jobs will either be replaced or workers will be okay because the great majority of people who do work in the energy industry, particularly in the Rust Belt and especially in coal industry, um, do live below the federal poverty line. I know a lot of people quite personally who, you know, were working in these coal jobs far, far after the average retirement in the country. Um, people who do you know, live below the poverty line do tend to, you know, work in the industry far, far, far longer. Um, and I was wondering if you really believe like a lot of these like green energy sources will come into these towns, which are otherwise dying without these industries. There are not a lot of job options for people once these jobs are lost. Um, a lot of renewable energy tends to be centered in either urban areas or um, these big like, you know, technological areas, you know, Silicon Valley. Um, are they really going to be coming to a lot of these towns, let's just say in rural New York and rural Pennsylvania, um, where it would really be necessary? These, you know, they are specialized jobs, of course. We'd require a lot of different technical training. You know, is it viable um, for these workers? Because, you know, oh, 500 people a year would be losing their jobs. It's still the livelihood of an immense amount of people. Um, thank you. Okay, so that is a great question, and it's really... If I had to choose one that I actually put a lot of focus on, uh, that um, maybe more than other researchers. 
My answer is uh, yes, that the, uh, the, the jobs can be created. It's a matter of policy. The jobs can be created in West Virginia. I've done a study for Pennsylvania. I've done a study for Ohio. Uh, I chose to do those states for exactly the reason you raised. They're very, you know, New York was pretty easy. 13,000 people in total. Uh, but oh, Pennsylvania has a huge fracking industry. They like their jobs. Uh, they pay more than the clean energy job. West Virginia, um, you know, it's the, it's this, West Virginia has the highest concentration of fossil fuel workers and it has the highest poverty rate in the country. So yeah, but the, the, if, if, if we think about a clean energy transformation, a green new deal in West Virginia, that means that West Virginia will get a disproportionate share of new investments to build out the clean energy economy. And I will disagree with you on the point, these are not specialized jobs any more than any other industry. There are, of course, they're specialized jobs. Uh, but the majority of jobs are in construction, in manufacturing, uh, truck drivers, uh, office managers, office assistants, uh, service jobs. These jobs expand out. And that would be true for West Virginia as it is any place else. So the model I showed you for New York, West Virginia, we showed that getting to zero emissions in West Virginia would entail creating 25,000 jobs in West Virginia. And the job losses per year from winding down fossil fuels is going to be less than 2,000 per year. So that's what, why at least you know, during our meeting, Manchin and his staffers said, oh, that sounds pretty good. And they did have a press conference with the leadership of the um, United Mine Workers after our study came out, endorsing a just transition for, for uh, West Virginia. What did it amount to in the end? Nothing. But um, the, the facts are there. And so um, it, this is not the green, uh, New Deal is not just a thing for research scientists in the Silicon Valley. There are jobs for them, but most of them are for everybody else. Okay. I do hate to bring this to a close, but I have good news and, and extra good news. The good news is that um, uh, Dr. Pollan will be with us um, for our luncheon out in the Roosevelt Quad. And all of this talk about consumption has made me very hungry. <laughs> so that I want to remind you that we do have this, this uh, luncheon and, and please join us there. And please thank our panelists, all three, one more time.